Peg, Tim. Another precious day Amen. of worshiping our Father. Amen. Hallelujah. He is our victor. We can always call on him. Amen. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer with my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain There is a faith to the war with the Lord so we find me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon point against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. Oh, yeah. This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror in prayer with Christ So firm on his promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon point against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God is my victory in me all of my life, in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to see, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to see. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to see. I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon for the gifts we shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare, God is my victory, and He is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know I'm guilty, be emptied again, the seed I've received I will sow. Well, good morning and welcome to the Nutrioso Bible Church 930 worship service disguised as the 11 o'clock worship service. Good to see all of you out there this morning, and I can tell you it has been a morning. We are operating right now on answered prayer, because when we showed up this morning, there was no power, <laughs> which makes it a little bit tough to put on a worship service on Facebook. But Jeremy came up with a plan, and everything was ready to go, and boom, the lights came on. So Amen. we're in good shape, yep. right? Everyone Amen. shake your heads, yes. We are thankful for that. Um, if you'd get your virtual bulletin, of course, that Linda Martin printed, here it is. It looks pretty good as usual. That neon pink shines and shows up. So take your bulletin. And the first announcement we want to go over this morning is please support the Bush Valley Craft Club. I was going to talk to Jody Larson about this. She's our point of contact, uh, but didn't get to. Oh, actually, I talked to Jody, but we didn't talk about the craft club. And uh, the quilt is still being raffled. I get it. I get from a a good, reliable, trusted source that uh, the auctions or the raffle is going to be in the fall. 
and that the tickets are a dollar each or six for five dollars. And Jody, if I've got that wrong, please let me know. But I would like to see, you know, maybe, let's be conservative about this. I'd like to see maybe two or 3,000 people get a hold of Jody and say, I'd like a raffle ticket. They do support churches in this area, ours being one, and also the school, the Alpine School. So please check with Jody on that. And it's that time again this summer uh, to consider Operation Christmas Child, which will be on top of us here in no time. Uh, Rebecca Dotson and Linda Martin are points of contact for that. Uh, Pastor Tom even said that he would deliver boxes to people's homes if they need them this early. And uh, we'll still be filling our boxes like we did last year. Um, and I'm sure that Linda and Rebecca will put out the suggested item list uh, and the age groups. I think there's about six age groups. And uh, however, there will be extra supplies on hand. Some folks from our family have agreed to purchase extra supplies and have them on hand at the church in case someone gets bound up by time and can't get to the store and do this and do that. They'll be here at the church. And, uh, or if we have to come up with some extra boxes at the last minute. So that's on top of us. Uh, be prayerful about that. Uh, we'd like to turn in a good number of boxes like we did last year, right? Shake your heads yes. Everyone's doing that. Okay. Also, um, a missionary moment. I have an a email from our missionaries in Mali, West Africa, uh, Tom and Laura Requat. And the numbers were so phenomenal on this email, I said, I have got to share this with the family. And this was dated July the 18th. And Tom says, thank you for your prayers these past couple of weeks as we have seen a steady number of children faithfully come to the Bible club to learn verses. Now this is going to stagger the imagination. Of these, three to four have finished the set of 113 memory verses, bringing the total, total to 11 children who have done that. Uh, this is quite an achievement, and these are quite applauded for their faithfulness and hard work. They each get a much sought after, highly coveted, very seldom seen piece of chocolate cake and some other great prizes like soccer balls. Now get this, there's two guys that come to Tom and Laura's house. One guy is named Aurmar, O-U-R-M-A-R, Aurmar, and D Diakalia. They finished memorizing an additional 300 memory verses, and that is on top of the 113 memory verses. Can you believe that? That is, that's goosebump stuff. So anyway, um, they're uh, translating the book of Titus right now. So it's sort of redundant to say this, but I know we lift our missionaries up. Keep them in your prayers. What a job they are doing. Okay, also, um, I've received 600, 700, maybe postcards, emails, phone calls. You know how that goes. They just smother you with this type of thing about fun with words. I, re I remember our first, second broadcast we had, and I may have to walk these words up to you, Luke. Um, our first broadcast, we talked about this particular word here, and the word would be quarantine. And I spent some time working on the word quarantine. And if you spell quarantine backwards, you, of course, get enchilada. And, that's, and, and people saw that and they said, well, what else can we do with these words? Because that's phenomenal. Well, here's another word. Actually, it's, a, it's a, a term we're all familiar with right now, social distancing. And I was, I was thinking, what can we do with that word? So I started spelling things backwards again. And of course, social distancing spelled backwards is refried beans. So just another segment of fun with words, something to do, you know, since you have a lot of time on your hands. And I wanted to say hi to our neighbors, part of our church family, 
is with Shirley right now at our house, Ed and Onita Davis are sitting right there watching our worship service. And usually Ed and Onita sit right about there. So I'm going to say, Ed and Onita, welcome aboard. And I've got a picture I want to share with you. Luke and I already went over this. My son, Matt, and daughter-in-law, Tracy, and four grandkids are with us, have been with us this weekend. We took a hike yesterday, and my nine-year-old grandson, Grady, has been a Christian now for about a year, knows exactly what it means to have Jesus living in his heart. And uh, we were on the San Francisco River, came across this great pool of water, and my daughter-in-law, Tracy, asked Grady, my grandson, would you like to be baptized? Because they've been talking to him about this, what baptism means. Grady said yes. So we all had a prayer on the shore, and then they stepped out into the water, and this is what it looked like just, just before Grady went under. Got that, Luke? So what a... I had a cantaloupe, of course, stuck in my throat and couldn't pray very well, but Grady is now baptized and loving it. Um, I think that takes care of announcements. Uh, two prayer requests I'd like to mention is um, Pastor Tom's daughter called. She has a fellow employee who has a child in their late 20s. And that child had no underlying health problems, contracted the COVID-19 disease, and passed away five days later. So with that in mind, please lift them up, that family. Uh, what state is that? Arizona. Arizona. Okay. They're local. All right. Um, lift them up because... Uh, it's just got to be crushing, absolutely crushing. Uh, also, Mike and Jody Larson's daughter uh, is in Avondale, still afflicted with COVID-19. I don't have an update on that, but they were on last week's list. Please pray. Please pray for this woman that uh, God would heal her. Are there any other requests coming in, Jeremy? Okay, Dan Griffiths out in New Mexico. I'm assuming they're in New Mexico, right, today? They are, okay. So remember Dan, any others? That's it? Okay. Well, those are the prayer requests. Those are the announcements. Thanks for being attentive and faithful to do that. The interesting thing about Skip is that his wife is an educator, <laughs> and apparently not much of it is rubbed off on him in regard to the area of spelling. So pray for him, please. <laughs> Back in college when I first got saved, I told a friend of mine, Randy was his name, probably still is. I told him I got saved, and, I, and he gave me a packet of scripture verses to memorize because he said, you're going to come under attack, and you're going to need to fight off these attacks. He says, so memorize these five scripture verses and be ready to use them. And one of them is the scripture verse I'm going to give you this morning, 1 Corinthians 10 13, no temptation has overtaken us, uh, overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, know, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape, that you will be able to bear it. Amen. Temptation is a part of life. You have been tempted and you will be tempted. It's going to happen. And we as Christians face the same temptations that the people out in the world face. Even Jesus, the man, 
face temptation. Remember three times he was tempted by the devil out in the wilderness. But he knew how to handle it and knew how to resist it. Our desire to sin can sometimes feel so much more powerful than our desire to do what is right before God. What's best to do is avoid those situations and places where we might uh, be subject to temptation. But if you should find yourself being tempted, remember that just as we should be faithful to God, God is faithful to us and will not allow us to be tempted beyond Amen. our ability to, to, and strength to resist. And he will provide a way of escape. It's just a matter of how strong are we. So ask ourselves, do we have the grounding to resist the temptation to sin? The Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. From you. you can't flee from, free from, uh, flee from him. You can't run fast enough to get away from him. He's going to come after you. So you need to be grounded in the scriptures. If you know scripture and can quote scripture, you have a solid basis for resisting temptation. It worked for Jesus. Remember, as I said, he was tempted three times from the devil, three times by the devil in the wilderness. And how did he overcome it? How did he resist? He quoted scripture. Remember, the, the devil would give him a, a specific temptation, and he would respond by saying, It is written, and then he would quote a pertinent scripture to resist that temptation. It worked for him. It can work for us. But you have to know your Bible and you have to know your scripture. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we've heard about situations, Lord. We've heard about a death from this wicked virus, Lord. We pray for that family. We pray for others, Lord, that may be uh, inflicted with this, Lord. We pray that people will be able to overcome this virus, Lord, that we will be able to keep it away from us, Lord, that we'll practice good uh, 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 habits in regard to uh, preventing the contracting of it, Lord. We pray for those in our congregation with needs, Lord. We pray you'll meet those needs. We pray you'll bring comfort in the lives of Everyone within this church and hearing this broadcast this morning, Lord. We lift up the name of Jesus, Lord, through the sung word, through the spoken word. Pray you'll be with our pastor as he delivers a message this morning about faith. And we ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Lord, the blood of Jesus, Lord, the blood of Jesus, Lord, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Lord, the cross of Jesus. Lord, the cross of Jesus. Lord, the cross of Jesus. He gave his life for me. Let's break Lord, the cross. Jesus, Lord of God, of Jesus, Lord of God, of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Oh, 
Good morning. My name is Abraham one last time, and this will be the concluding lesson in the messages that I've been bringing concerning the faith that God brought into my life. I'd ask you a question this morning. Which would you rather have guiding your life, guiding the steps that you take? Would you rather live a life of fear or one of trust. You have a choice. I had a choice. As I get ready to conclude, I was thinking about some questions that people have asked me over the years concerning faith. And they consider me somewhat of a model. I humbly accept that. But I'd like to share those with you in case there's some questions that you have. The first question that's oftentimes asked me is, can I really ever develop a trust in God if I wasn't raised from an early age in a Christian home? And my answer to that has always been, absolutely. You go back to the Word of God and it says, I was raised in a pagan home. And so it doesn't matter whether you started out in a godly home, a Christian home or whatever, you can develop faith no matter what your background is if you'll just accept the call of God. Another question I also oftentimes am asked, can a person really develop faith if they don't come to God until they're later in life? And I'd say I'm a living proof that you can because I was in my early 70s when God called me. And so if it could happen to me, God's calling you. It can happen in your life. Another question that uh, I'm oftentimes asked is, I begin to walk in faith and I start out in fear. I have moments of triumph where I really think my trust factor is growing. And then I tend to slip back. Are relapses going to happen in a person's life? And again, I'd say, just go to what God wrote about my life. I started out really slow. 
There were times when I started to follow him one step forward, two steps back. That is how God develops faith in a person's life. It doesn't just all come at once. A lightning bolt and it's there. It comes through growth. So don't become discouraged with that. Now I know discouragement's a part of it. I felt discouragement at time. But the truth of the matter is it's part of the process. Uh, The Christian writers call it sanctification. It's growth. It's becoming what God would have you be. But then one particular question as we begin to move into this final lesson. I had a writer one time ask me, will I still be considered a true person of God if I still continue to have troubles in my life? I seem to have troubles in my life. Does that mean that I'm out of the will of God? And you know, that's really a difficult question to answer. Because there are some things that come into our life as challenges that are self-generated. Because we have not followed the will of God, and now we have to deal with the consequences. Uh, Sometimes God brings exams into our life. Sometimes we do things wrong that we bring consequences to our life. But here is the beautiful truth about God. He never lets an opportunity pass to where he doesn't use that, if we really love him, to draw closer to him. Later after my life, there was an apostle who you know well, and I've gotten to know him well, called Paul. And he said this in Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 28, in concerning uh, things that happen in our lives. In Romans 8, 28, Paul said, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God sometimes brings tests into our life to where we can begin to develop that type of trust we need in him. Sometimes he takes the mistakes that we make in life and the consequences that come with them, as another way of us learning to see that God is always trustworthy. But in everything, everything, God will work those things together for good if we love him and if we're called according to his purpose. James, another one of Jesus' apostles, said this, And I'd really like you to think about this because so many of us try to avoid and we really get resentful when those tough times come. James said this in the first chapter, verse 2, James 1, 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, Your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, you will complete, you will have nothing lacking. What's he saying? Faith is important to God. It should be important to us. So when God is allowing challenges to come into our life, whether he puts them there, whether they're self-generated, rejoice. Because God is going to use that as an opportunity to draw you closer to his heart and to enable you to trust him more. And why? Because trust, faith, is the end of the wonderful relationship with God. If you want to become at one with God, you have to trust him fully. But now I'd like to just take you into this last part of my life. The time when I really found out for the first time that my faith in God was genuine and it was far different than what it was in the, in the very beginning of my walk with him some 25 years earlier. Now, at 100 years old, I hit the jackpot. I got a son. And if you don't think that a man can be excited at 100 years old, with a son, you just don't know. Because at 100 years old, 
Sarah and I had had what we had been dreaming of all through our marriage. We had a boy. Why were we excited? Well, first of all, we had a child in our life. I had somebody who could take my family name and it wouldn't just fall off into a deep abyss, but my family name could be carried on. And now I had somebody that I could leave all of the possessions that God had given to me. I could give them to somebody who I loved, who was one of my own children. But also, oh, also, I was excited because my Sarah was vindicated. For years, people had looked at Sarah and said, she looks like a beautiful woman. She seems like a sweet lady, but there's got to be something wrong with her or God would have blessed her with a child. And they said, there's something in her life that God knows that we don't know that he is basically cursing her for. But now as Sarah gives birth to a child so late in life, Instead of condemnation, she has vindication and she is being told basically by God, here, here is the child and it's a miracle baby. It's just not one of those things that happen by biology. Here is a child to say, I am not disappointed with you, but I am elevating you. And for me personally, to see the smile on my Sarah's face, see it looking so beautifully at that child, it just lifted my heart. There was such joy and peace and fulfillment within our tent. We were so happy, you can't even believe the high that I was on. And for the next 15 years or so, I poured my heart into that boy called Isaac. I poured my heart into him. I didn't want him to have to grow up and struggle with his faith the way I did, having grown up in a pagan home. I wanted him to experience a relationship with God that began at an early age, didn't have to wait until it was in its 70s. I poured everything I had, in, everything about raising sheep and cattle and God. I poured my life into this child. He was my miracle son. And I rejoiced in it. And so I'm sure you're saying right now, well, that's the end of the story, right? You and Sarah and Isaac lived happily ever after for the rest of your life. But I'm going to ask you when you have time, look in your Bible at Genesis 22, because it's going to talk to you about the absolute pinnacle when I knew that God had become real and trust in my life. Now, Again, I want you to understand that everything that was written about me, and there's so many stories, but they all had one purpose. It was to show how a person can move from a life of fear into a life of faith. How a person can live with a life without God into a life with God. And so here's where my story begins. Wasn't expecting anything different. And I remember one morning I woke up, beautiful day, and I heard this voice, and it was God's. I'd heard his voice before. And he said, Abraham, I have something I want you to do. And I said, okay, God, what is it? I want you to give a sacrifice to me. All right, Lord, we've done sacrifices before. That's okay. I'll go get the wood. I'll make sure the knife is sharpened. I'll get the fire. I'll get the donkey, whatever we need to do. We'll prepare an altar. And I'll even go get the animal. Abraham, about the animal. Don't bring an animal. Well, Lord, if I don't have an animal, how can I have a sacrifice? Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. And I stopped in my tracks and I said, do you want me to go find Ishmael? He's been driven away. Do you want me to get Ishmael and bring him back to sacrifice to you? And I heard the voice say, I'm not talking about Ishmael. 
It's not Ishmael I'm asking you to sacrifice. I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. I have to tell you that those were some of the most shocking words I'd ever heard in my life. How could I sacrifice Isaac to him? And I said to myself, and I, and I think I said to the Lord, Lord, I've been waiting for this boy for a hundred years. He's the child that you promised me. If I sacrifice him, where's your promise about not only a son, but a great nation and all of that? Where is that at if I sacrifice my son? And Lord, if I sacrifice my son, do you realize that my relationship with Sarah is going to be toast? She's so happy now. What's she going to be like when not only does her son die, but he dies at my hand? And Lord, I've done sacrifices before. You know I've done them. How can I tie my son up on that pile of rocks and wood? How can I lift his head as I did a lamb or a goat and slit? How could my hand ever do that? How could I light a fire and watch the child that I love so much burn because I'm burning him? And Lord, I, I've got to be honest with you. If, if you were to ask me that, I couldn't sleep at night and I'd have a horrible time worshiping you. Lord, it doesn't make sense. And the Lord said, Abraham, do you trust me? Well, yeah, I do, Lord. I trust you. Do you really trust me? Have I ever let you down? No, you've never let me down. I've let myself down at times. Then trust me. Do what I'm asking you to do. Now, the old Abraham, the old Abraham, remember last week I taught to you about our natural response in life to fear we either fight or we flee? The old Abraham would have sat there and argued a storm with God. I would have shaken my fist, said, I'm not going to do it. I would have fought with him. Or the old Abraham also had a way of running at times when he dealt with a problem. I would have packed up my family and tried to run back to Mesopotamia where maybe I would have had my family protected by the God that I grew up with called sin. But it's 25 years after I began my walk with God. And I have to tell you, perfect man, no. No, I'm not a perfect man. But I was a man who had truly come to trust God more. So I said, okay, God, I, I don't understand, but let's go. Where are we going to? Mount Moriah, three days journey. It's not something that you're going to get out of the way quickly. So pack and go. And so I did it. A man 25 years ago, Abraham 25 years ago, wouldn't have even considered this. But I had developed in my walk and trust with God. And so two servants, my son and I, gathered the wood, put it on the back of the donkey. We put everything together and they said, Father, I remember Isaac saying, which lamb do you want me to get? Which goat? We'll take care of that later. For three days we walked. I got to tell you, that was the longest three days of my life. We walked. There wasn't a whole lot of conversation. My mind was a little preoccupied. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I don't understand. But still I went. Because I'd come to a point to where I did trust him. And I wanted to obey him. But it just didn't make sense. After three days, I began to see that mountaintop that I knew was Moriah. And it, my heart began to sink a little bit. Because I knew I was coming to that moment. And we came short of Mount Moriah and we stopped and I told my two servants, you wait here. Isaac and I are going to go on. And again, it was such a difficult task. We climbed. 
And I kept saying, God, I trust you. I trust you. But you know something remarkable that happened in my heart? I knew I would sacrifice Isaac, but I also didn't believe that God would be untrue to his promise. I believed that somehow, if I obeyed God, I wasn't going to lose my son, but that another miracle would happen in my life. You say, well, it's all over now, so it's easy to talk boldly about what you did. But may I give you witness by the Holy Spirit as to where my heart was and what I really believed was happening, that if I sacrificed my son, somehow I would keep him? Take a look in the record that the Holy Spirit gives in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verse 5. Look at the words that are there. When the servants were watching me go away and they said, do you want us to come with you, Master? In Genesis 22, 5, the Holy Spirit records, I said to the servant, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will return. I wasn't lying to them. I honestly believe that the boy and I would return We will worship there, and we, not I will come back, we will come back. I didn't know how God was going to work it out, but I believed, as impossible as it was, that he was going to work it out. You know something really amazing, and you're going to say, you need to go get a mental check out right now, Abraham? I actually believed that God, if I sacrificed my son and if I burned him, that God was so powerful and so true to his word that he could even resurrect him and then send him back with me. You say, oh, come on, you didn't really feel that way. It's all over now, so you're coming up with these stories. The Holy Spirit will give testimony to that because through the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, Hebrews 11, verse 17, listen to what the Holy Spirit said about my mindset as I was about ready to sacrifice my son. Hebrews eleven seventeen. it was by faith, in other words, trust, correct? Use those two words interchangeably. It was by trust that Abraham, me, offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Look at verse 19. Abraham reasoned. This is where my head was. 25 years after I ran away from everything in fear, this is where my head was. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to what? Bring him back to life again. Sounds totally unreal. And yet I believed that if I killed my son, burned him in the flames of sacrifice, that God could restore him to me completely. That's the type of trust and faith that I had. So as Isaac and I put those rocks together to build the altar and I put the wood on there, I was ready to go because I trusted God more than you could ever imagine after 25 years of walking with him. But I want you to think about the other problem that I had at the time. How old am I? I'm 115 or thereabout. About. My son, he was in his early to mid-teens. He is a lot faster than his father is. When he asks, where's the animal, I think he's beginning to understand what may be going on here. And all he had to do was do a quick sprint, and he would have been gone, and I wouldn't have caught him. If I had touched him, he could have shoved me away and said, I don't know what you think we're doing here, but this isn't going to happen. But I had poured my heart, my faith, 
my love of God into Isaac. And when I came to him, he didn't struggle, he didn't resist, he submitted. As I was submitting my heart to God, my obedience to God, Isaac was light years beyond where I was even at 70. As I took his wrist to bind him, he didn't resist me. He trusted me. And he allowed me to bind him. And he didn't kick and flail as I lifted him up and placed him on the altar. He laid calmly. No terror. He laid calmly. I took my knife... I didn't want to prolong this. I lifted his head. I know some people talk about plunging. That's not the way you sacrifice. You do that. And as I lifted his neck and was about ready to make the pull, I heard, Abraham, stop! And I did. And it was an angel And he said something so remarkable to me. So remarkable. He said, I am so proud of you. I'm going to paraphrase this, bring in a bunch of verses together. But in essence, God through the angel said, Abraham, I'm so proud of you. You have trusted me to the point where you wouldn't hold back the most important thing in your life. You are willing to give me your very son, Isaac. And then he went on to again talk about all of the promises. It amazed me. It amazed me. He could have run, but there he lay. God had taken a man who was completely controlled by passions and fears and turned him into a man of faith. And I had come to learn over those years that the basis of our faith in God is when we release control of all things in life to him. I want you to think about this. Think about the things that you are afraid of in life. Why are you afraid? Because you're afraid of them being taken away from you. But when you have nothing less to cling to, now you can open your hands and receive what God has. You know, we frantically cling. I have possessions. We frantically cling to our occupations. We frantically cling to the things that we're afraid of losing. There are people we're afraid of losing, like I was afraid of losing Isaac. There, even our own lives, we were afraid of losing, and we cling on to them so tight, and we're afraid of losing them, and so we'll do everything possible not to lose them. But when we release them again, God can place those things in our hand that he wants to bless us even greater. Jesus made a statement to you, and it applies to exactly what I'm talking about here. The attitude we have in life that allows us to move from a life based on fear, losing things, to a life of trust to where he can give us all things. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, our Lord said in verse 27, don't worry about the things of this life. You hear what he said? Don't worry about losing the things of this life. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all of his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. So if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, 
will he not take much better care of you? Why do you have so little faith? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all of these other things will be given to you. You know what he is saying? Jesus is teaching the lesson it took me 25 years to learn. When you frantically cling on to things that you're afraid of being without, there are no hands left open to receive the things that he wants to give us. I know the things that scared me to death that I would lose in life. But my question to you this morning is, what things are you petrified of losing? Are there possessions that if the government said tomorrow, either deny your faith or I will take your bank accounts, your money? That has happened over and over through the years. People have faced this. This is not some out there thing. This is something that's even happening today. Would you be so fearful of losing those things? Would you cling on to them so tight that you would deny your faith and not trust God to make do? Or would you say, take them. I'll take God. Your place in life, your reputation with people, either you agree with us and give up your faith in this religion of yours, or we won't accept you as family anymore. Would you cling to that relationship with your family members, maybe a child, maybe a wife or somebody else? Or would you say, as painful as it would be to lose, I open them because God is who I cling to. Do you cling to your own life in that way, your health in that way, where you're so afraid of losing it that you never really gain it? Jesus made this statement, and I want you to think about it right now because it has everything to do from moving from fear to where you have total trust. He said it in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 24. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my follower, this is not an option like what we put on our trucks or cars. This is what Jesus says. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. In other words, you need to quit clinging to things. Take up your cross. In other words, crucify those things, sacrifice them, and follow me. Because if you try to hang on to your life, you will what? You'll lose it. You cannot receive the blessings of God when you're gripping things of this world so tightly. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. And what you do, you benefit. And what benefit is it up to you if you gain the whole world? You hold on to it, you keep it in your possession, and lose your own soul. So as I close this morning, I want to ask you three quick questions. Do you want to exchange your fear, life of fear, for a life of trust and faith? If you do, release your hands. Quit clinging to the things of this world. Do you want to have a oneness with God? Then let your death grip go on the things of this life. Do you want to have an abundant life? Then open your hands and let go so that you can receive the abundance that God wants to give us. Grip or open? Fear, faith. The answer is in your hands and it's a gift God wants to give. Heavenly Father, you came into my life a pagan, 70 years old. Most people are too stubborn to change at that time, too set in their ways. But you came in, you called me, 
You put up with my imperfections. You put up with my mistakes. You put up with me going one step forward and two steps back, but you never gave up. You allowed everything that happened in my life to not drive me away from you, but to pull me closer to you. Father, this morning, if there is somebody listening, somebody who is completely in the grips of fear, afraid of losing things in this life, it is a difficult thing, Father, to release. But what you showed me, not because you needed it proved to you, you showed me that I could come to a point in my life to where it was difficult, but I would be willing to give up the most dear thing in my life to have you. But the thing that I learned was in being obedient and in trusting you, not only did I keep Isaac, but I also got oneness with you, which was the greatest blessing of all. Father, that is in Jesus Christ. If there's anybody who's never surrendered and accepted Jesus as Savior, please let them do what I did. Step up and say, God, I'm fearful of where we're going, but I will follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let us rejoice and go in victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. I heard it all by story. I say to came from glory. Now he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his journey of his precious blood that told me. And I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me in His redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory. Satan was the enemy of Abraham. Satan is our enemy. He knows where our weak spots are. He knows what we're afraid of giving up, of losing. And he uses us to preoccupy our attention with those things. God gives us the ability to say, Satan, you got nothing on me. If you want my possessions, they're God's, take them. If you want the friends in life that would be painful to lose, take them. I've got God. If you want my life, sooner or later, this shell's going to go away. So it's now or later. But when we stop worrying about things, when we stop fretting about losing things and let our death grip go, then Satan no longer has anything to hold over us and we are free to trust God and enjoy a life of faith rather than fear. I pray that you'll think about this. And next week, join me. We'll be studying some of the parables of Jesus, the great, some of the greatest stories ever told. Have a great week and may God bless you.